Tonight, promises for the middle class. Can Justin Trudeau push past the controversy? I know I particularly hurt uh, people uh, who are racialized. Will cuts to taxes and cell phone bills be enough to change the channel? The war room strategists are standing by. As the parties talk about the cost of housing, we look at the realities of renting in an unaffordable city. I'm out $3,300. What you need to know before you make an e-transfer, a go public investigation. And you're beautiful on the outside, you're beautiful on the inside. And one of the stars of Queer Eye comes out as HIV positive. His message about stigma and strength in 2019. This is The National. Party leaders are offering up more spending to help those in need, more pledges to save you money. But again today, hindering that forward momentum, the shock of this campaign. Justin Trudeau's brown and black face photos. Bonjour. Bonjour, much to see you. This guy's a natural. Nailed it. On Sundays during this campaign, we're going big on politics, the polls, the war room strategies, and how all of it is playing with voters like you. Today, party leaders promised more for veterans, people affected by climate change, and those struggling with high cell phone bills. But as David Cochran shows us, for the Liberals, changing the conversation will not be that easy. In the midst of controversy, the Liberal campaign plunged into one of the most diverse cities in Canada. From a backyard in Brampton, Ontario, Justin Trudeau tried to get back on message. We made uh, a promise to Canadians that we would put growth for the middle class and people working hard to join it at the centre of everything we do. Trudeau wants to talk about the future of the middle class, but he keeps facing questions about his past. Can you say definitively that you haven't worn blackface since 2001? I have been uh, uh, very uh, forthright with Canadians uh, on this issue, and I will continue to be. He called himself forthright, but Trudeau didn't answer the question, leaving the possibility of more incidents, more videos, more photos hanging over his campaign. I think what it shows ultimately uh, is, uh, is who Justin Trudeau really is. Andrew Shear says Trudeau has been exposed as a hypocrite. Uh, someone who uh, has one set of rules for everyone else, one set of rules, rules for himself, someone who won't hold himself to the standards he sets for other, other people. Now Canadians can make their ultimate determination about whether or not they trust Justin Trudeau. While Trudeau tries to mitigate a political disaster, Jugmeet Singh today focused on mitigating climate disasters after spending much of yesterday discussing blackface and brownface. We know that climate change is real, its impact is real, and it's hurting people, it's hurting families. Things as precious as your home or your business are being impacted. Trudeau has reached out to Singh, wanting to personally apologize. Singh is willing to talk, but doesn't want to be used as a prop in Trudeau's rehabilitation. So to this point, the conversation hasn't happened. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Last week's revelations certainly changed the campaign, but what effect has it had, if any, yet on the polls? We asked CBC poll analyst Eric Grenier to break down the latest numbers for us. Rosie, we're still seeing a pretty close race between the Conservatives and the Liberals nationwide. Let's look at where things stand in the poll tracker right now. We have only about a one-point gap between the Conservatives and the Liberals. We started this campaign with the two parties neck and neck, New Democrats and Greens still in third and f in fourth place. Now, the polls that we've seen over the last few hours suggest that it's too early to say whether Justin Trudeau's blackface scandal is going to have any impact. Some polls have suggested really no movement at all. Others have suggested maybe a bit of a drop for the Liberals, but still it is too early to see. What we do still see, however, is that the Liberals do have an advantage in the seat projections because of the lead that they still hold in places like Ontario and Quebec. Right now, we'd estimate that the Liberals would win somewhere around 160 seats, the Conservatives somewhere around 145. That's both below the 170 seat mark needed for a majority government. And you can see that between these two parties, lots of overlap in terms of who would be the most likely to win the most seats. But if we look at that probability of who would come out of this election with the most seats right now, just a few days ago, we had the Liberals favorite at about a 69% chance that they would win the most seats based on where the numbers were. Right now, we're looking at about 58% chance. This is little better than a coin toss. So we'll have to wait and see what the real impact will be. Right now, it is still a very close race.
Okay, now to those campaign promises that we mentioned earlier. The Liberal, Conservative and NDP leaders were all out pitching their policy to voters, to you, most aimed at your pocketbook. Our reporters are travelling with the campaign. I'm Salima Shivji with the Liberal campaign, where there was only one main event today in Brampton. Justin Trudeau had two flashy promises to appeal to the middle-class suburban voters he needs. A tax break, making sure that by 2023, Canadians won't pay taxes on the first $15,000 they earn, but it won't apply to the very wealthy. The Liberals are also promising to help you save 25% on your cell phone bill, only how they'll get the telecom giants on board is a little vague. We will uh, strengthen and bring in further competition into the market uh, if uh, they are unable to achieve that. Yet another promise the Liberals are hoping will get them back on message. I'm Evan Dyer with the Conservative campaign on a day that began in Prince Edward Island and continued here in Newfoundland. This is an area full of veterans and today was all about veterans with the Conservatives announcing a plan to overhaul the system of disability pensions for veterans and clear the backlog of applications for benefits. Of course, there's a tough point to this cell, which is that veterans here remember how the Harper government closed many veterans offices and laid off staff at Veterans Affairs. Some of the people that we spoke to today said they were willing to turn the page and trust that a new Conservative government would do things differently, others not so much. Right now, trust in government, uh, any party is very low, obviously right now, especially from the veterans community. This was the briefest of visits to Newfoundland, a place where the Conservatives have few real prospects of picking up a seat from here back to the greater Toronto area. I'm Ashley Burke with the NDP campaign. This morning, the party's leader, Jagmeet Singh, visited a neighbourhood in Gatineau, Quebec, still recovering from severe flooding. He spoke to the owners of a restaurant affected and announced $2.5 billion over four years for projects to help combat extreme weather events. We give investments to municipalities right now they can put in place the infrastructure to avoid this from happening. This would be on top of the $2 billion the Liberals have already pledged over 10 years. The NDP says the money will come in part from taxing the ultra-rich and cancelling fossil fuel subsidies. Singh heads to New Brunswick tomorrow. Of course, the leaders will hit the road again tomorrow with stops scheduled across Ontario and the Maritimes. On Tuesday, though, Justin Trudeau will visit Surrey, B.C. That's a key battleground in this election. It's part of Metro Vancouver, home to five federal ridings and more than 500,000 people. It also struggles with gang and gun violence, something that's already become an election issue. The Liberals announced their gun control plans last week, which include banning semi-automatic assault weapons and letting municipalities decide if they want to ban handguns. Communities are suffering, so we're going to do more and we're going to do better. The Conservatives are proposing lifetime gun bans for those convicted of violent crimes and gang activity. The NDP wants to crack down on illegal guns and target gun smuggling. And the Greens say they're in favour of banning assault weapons and handguns too. Well, in Surrey, residents are just looking for any solution that works. Tanya Fletcher takes us there. It's 4 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. Police descend on the Surrey Central Sky Train Station, officers cutting through crowds of commuters. It's a scene that would stop many in their tracks, but not here. So we just saw the police roll up, respond to some sort of incident, and it seemed like people barely even blinked. Yeah, uh, crime in Surrey is a daily life thing. Um, People definitely just walk by it. They don't even blink to see it anymore. It's Public worry over gun violence reached a boiling point in the spring of 2018 when two teenagers were killed in a targeted shooting. Mounting frustrations drew thousands to a rally, including families of the victims. We've lost our son. He had a bright future. And now we're left with nothing. Our community needs to wake up. Fed up with the lack of government action, community leaders formed a group called Wake Up Surrey. Gurpreet Sahoda is one of the founders. How big of an election issue is safety in Surrey? It's a huge issue. And he believes it's an issue that could swing votes here. All of Surrey's five federal ridings are currently held by the Liberals, but the public safety outcry has become much louder since that last election. Zahoda's group has met face-to-face -face with Justin Trudeau, Andrew Scheer and Jagmeet Singh in the past year. We have heard lots of promises, but uh, nothing concrete came up from Ottawa.
He says the leaders listened, but they still don't feel heard. They've been lobbying for laws to change and for more funding. We asked for 40 million, and that was the well-calculated money to uh, prevent these things. And we only got, I think, six or seven million. Back at the SkyTrain station, it's a topic that resonates deeply with voters. I think people are fed up, and I think they are looking for change or they're looking for something different, but I don't think they know what the answer is. The answer could come in the form of a campaign promise, one that'll be key to unlocking votes here. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Surrey, B.C. Lots more election coverage still ahead. Our special Sunday political panel, The War Room, is coming up in about 10 minutes' time. Well, earlier you heard climate change come up on the campaign trail, and it will again. And tomorrow, world leaders will be meeting for a major climate summit at the United Nations. Just today, a new UN report raised yet another alarm. But as Paul Hunter tells us, some leaders still don't seem to be listening. It was merely a tropical depression, but in Houston, it became a catastrophe. Rising waters and lives ruined by the latest storm worsened by climate change. Today, Donald Trump praised the work of those who went to the rescue. We really have it down to a science now. In the last three and a half years, we've done something that nobody's done. Nobody's reacted to hurricanes and flooding like the Trump administration. And nobody's helped Texas like the Trump administration. Trump, who questions the science of climate change, vowed to pull out of the Paris Accord and rolled back all kinds of environmental regulations, will no doubt be on the minds of those in New York tomorrow for a summit on climate at the United Nations. And so, in the wake of Houston and before that, Hurricane Dorian that left parts of the Bahamas in ruin, a new report with a sobering picture of the effects of climate change. The past five years on Earth, the warmest on record. Sea levels are now rising more quickly than predicted. And, says the report, greenhouse gases are at record highs. What do we want? Demonstrations, yet again on this issue, have been urging world leaders to do more before it's too late, says the head of the group that put together the new report. I think that we can still solve this problem, but uh, we have to start moving more quickly and uh, the costs are rising, uh, cost of in inaction is, is, is rising. So the longer we wait, uh, uh, the more expensive it's going to be. And so tomorrow, some 60 world leaders will gather at the UN to move forward on this. Not among them, Donald Trump, who will be in New York and will be at the United Nations, but has chosen to skip the summit. He'll attend instead a panel on religious freedom. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Now to a go public investigation into e-transfers. Canadians use them millions of times every month to send money. But a Manitoba man has a warning tonight about the risks involved. Erica Johnson has this go public investigation. Rene Trudeau hired a contractor to install a new front door, then used e-transfer to send him $3,300. But the contractor didn't get the money. I kind of panicked because uh, at this point, all, all, all $3,300 is gone from my account. I'm out $3,300. It was the beginning of a frustrating seven-month battle with his bank to try to get his money back. Eventually, TD told him someone hacked into his contractor's email and saw the e-transfer come in. Because Trudeau had asked an easy security question, the fraudster answered it correctly and redirected the money to another bank. A decision by TD's ombudsman says it was an email breach. Therefore, the bank did not err. Rene Trudeau is one of dozens of people who've contacted GoPublic after losing money this way. Many saying they didn't realize their emails could be hacked or that they'd be on the hook if a fraudster correctly answered their security question. We've seen the ads where it says it's a safe way to send money. As with most banks, the fine print in TD's electronic agreement says customers using e-transfer must ask a strong security question that only the sender and receiver can answer. Also, it warns, do not send the answer via email. This cybercrime detective says financial institutions need to do a better job of letting customers using e-transfer know they have obligations if they want protection. They have a huge responsibility to their consumers. Um, you know, they are looking at people's uh, savings, people's pensions, people's investments. So I think they uh, should probably take the time and, and be more proactive. 
after GoPublic contacted Trudeau's bank, TD and its customer worked out a deal. TD required the details to be kept confidential. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. Here are some other stories we're following tonight on The National. British travel company Thomas Cook has filed for bankruptcy, leaving as many as 150,000 people stranded on vacation. One of the UK's best-known brands, the company, says planes in the air right now will carry on as planned, but no new flights will take off. The UK's Civil Aviation Authority says because of the, quote, unprecedented number of British customers overseas, they have secured a fleet of aircraft from around the world to bring people home. We are also watching L.A., where it's another golden night for TV's golden age. Game of Thrones dominated the nominations with 14 of them, but several Canadians are also walking the red carpet, including Sandra O, oh, Samantha B, and a CBC show, also making its Emmy debut. The day will come when we are no longer social Schitt's Creek has gone from cult to critical to commercial hit, and in its fifth season, uh, it was nominated for four Emmys. Leads Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara lost in their categories, but best comedic series still to come. You know, for 17 years, as like trapped and sad as I was, I did have so many little pockets of joy where I was performing and having so much fun, and I was just in my skin and loving it. Even when it was hard. The Netflix makeover show Queer Eye won multiple Emmys earlier this week. This weekend, one of its stars, Jonathan Van Ness, revealed that seven years ago he tested positive for HIV. When Queer Eye came out, he told the New York Times, it was really difficult because I was like, do I want to talk about my status? Well, despite the passing of decades and tremendous advances in treatment, the stigma around HIV and AIDS remains widespread. But as Marina von Stackelberg shows us, that is changing. This red ribbon fundraiser is aimed at spreading public awareness and empathy for people infected with HIV. But the very people it serves can be afraid to attend because someone might guess their status. It was difficult for me to understand as someone who puts on this event that people who have HIV wouldn't want to come to support it. Didn't wear red shoes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this performer says HIV isn't the death sentence it once was. I came out in the AIDS era and I had many friends die. Lead us! These days, people at risk of contracting HIV can go on a prophylactic drug treatment that protects them. And those who have HIV can take medication that makes the virus virtually impossible to transmit. The majority of people live long and healthy lives. And now they have a new role model. Jonathan Van Ness, the highly animated hairstylist on the hit Netflix show Queer Eye. He's revealed that his new memoir chronicles his journey to self-acceptance. I want to serve faith. As a healthy and proud member of the HIV positive community. Other people can see this in, uh, in the rest of the world and say, hey, somebody else has this too. Christine Bebo has been HIV positive for 10 years. Just a few years ago, she decided she wants others to know. And I'm tired of, you know, being this closet HIV positive person and dealing with stigma on my own. She says talking openly about your HIV status helps others to open up. It takes a lot for a person to say, hey, you know, I'm HIV positive. Marina Von Stackelberg, CBC News, Winnipeg. More news ahead on The National. An American wrestling star goes up against a Canadian heavyweight, the Alberta RCMP. Canada is terrible, and I can't wait to get back. Welcome, Debbie. Oh. <laughs> Aw, he's great. The cross-border kerfuffle turned viral sensation. Plus. More election coverage ahead. Can the Liberals get back on message after a controversial week? Our Sunday political panel is standing by, and their vote could decide the election. We asked six millennials what matters most to them. And one of your biggest issues, affordable housing. David Common takes us to a city where the vacancy rate is basically zero. We'll be right back. My name is David Hurley. My name is Shakir Chambers. My name is Michael Hay. 
I formerly worked for Harper's Prime Minister's Office and for the Ontario government on Doug Ford's election campaign. I ran two national campaigns for the Liberal Party under the leadership of Paul Martin. In 2017, I was Jigmeet Singh's leadership campaign director. This election will be divisive. And the last one for at least two of the major party leaders. This election will be historic. Tonight, we're going to get a closer look at the controversy that threw the federal election campaign off course. It's now been five days since Justin Trudeau was forced to face his past. The Liberal leader has had to answer questions every single day he's been on the trail. The first apology came immediately after the story broke. I'm pissed off at myself for having done it. I wish I hadn't done it, but I did it. And I apologize for it. And then again the next day with a longer but not definitive explanation. Darkening your face, uh, regardless of the context or the circumstances, is always unacceptable. And again today, more questions about the controversy, but Trudeau was clearly trying to turn the page. I've been very clear with Canadians on this issue over the past number of days. So how do Liberals move forward and how do the other parties handle this politically? Good day for the war room. David, Shakir and Michael all here. So who would have thought we would be, be in this space talking about this thing a week ago, but here we are. So I, I want to start with where we are with this story. Um, certainly not at the beginning, but are we anywhere near the end, Shakir, do you think? Uh, I think there's a lot more for it to play out, right? Uh, Trudeau wanted to apologize to Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh has kind of delayed that apology. There's still unanswered questions about how many times have you wore blackface? There's no definitive answer. So I think there's more to actually play out with Trudeau and some of the answers he's going to have to give to Canadians. What do you think, Michael? I think that the Liberals are, are trying to move on with this story and they're trying to make make it so that it's just about Justin Trudeau uh, and in making it just about Justin Trudeau and convincing Canadians or trying to convince Canadians that it's about um, some, mis some political mistakes or some racist mistakes that he's made in the past instead of about what's really at issue here, which is systemic racism, uh, systemic racism which allowed this blackface to happen in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, he's, by making it about himself, he's trying to make it so that an apology is enough. Mm -hmm. um, and if it were to be made about systemic racism, uh, then, then he would be accountable for the last four years and the inaction of his government on on racism in Canada. What do you think, David? Where are we with this? Well, I guess a little bit contrary to Michael, I would say that um, I would say that uh, probably his positioning on these kinds of issues is helping him get through this to the extent that he's getting so through it. There are things he's right? done previously. We don't, we don't know how he's getting through it yet, but to the extent that he's getting through it, I, th I see people leaning on his record and I see people leaning on what he's been like over the, over the recent years mm -hmm. to justify what he did before. I think what's interesting about it is I don't know that we know what it is. So it feels like a big thing in the campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that all the parties have to figure out is why is it a big thing? So the most obvious thing is it's a racism thing. But it's felt to me from the beginning like it was unlikely that most Canadians were going to conclude that Justin Trudeau was a racist. And it doesn't really appear that they are concluding yep. that from the kind of anecdotal evidence that we have around us. Nonetheless, it does appear if you watch the Liberal campaign as though they're feeling like it's hurting them because the way they're acting, uh, pulling out one major policy after another, this yeah. is like today is two big guns, yeah. and they kind of look like they're rushing them out, if you might say. So it looks to me like they feel it's hurting them, but in what way is it hurting yeah. them? Is it playing to the he's not who he looks like he is, or what is it playing to? So I don't know what kind of legs it has. I don't know how it's going on because I'm not sure we know what it is yet. Yeah, and let me just, as a caveat, say I, I'm well aware that this whole event has has really made some people uncomfortable and hurt them deeply and so we you know we're not trying to be callous and having a political conversation about it but but we do have to have that conversation too so Shakiri. so I was just gonna add I think one way that it might hurt them is with the youth vote um, in 2015 they really mobilized that youth vote on a variety of different policy issues I think a lot of youth put a lot of faith in Trudeau and this is gonna have a lot of implications especially when you compound that with um, his inability to deliver on certain initiatives like electoral reform maybe he didn't go hard enough on in the environmental issues then you say that he's a hypocrite on like some of the racial issues I think the youth are either, maybe they're not going to um, not vote for the Liberals, they're not going to vote for the NDP, they're not going to vote for the Conservatives, they're just going to stay home and say, you know what, yep. maybe we don't cast ballots but, in But do you, do you think, Shakir, as, as David does, that it's not that people are reading this as a racist thing, it's more they're reading it as a I'm disappointed thing? Yeah, I think it's, 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 it's I'm a disappointed thing, but I would say, um, 
some of the folks that I talk to, it's just when it's multiple instances, you have to question how could you, why was this so funny? so many times, yeah. right? That's when I think it starts to become, sure, you can say he's not a racist, but to think this is an acceptable from someone who's a very well-educated person, his father was a former prime minister, that's when you start to question what is really going on here. Why was it funny to you? And I, I do think, I completely agree with Shakir, and I think that youth, like the next generation, can see through this and see that it is actually about racism and that he has a record uh, of his four years of saying the, maybe saying the right things about race but not actually doing the right things. So he hasn't brought in a federal ban on carding, for example. He hasn't stopped the over-policing of black and indigenous communities. He hasn't brought clean, wa clean drinking water to, to reserves in Canada. Well, they're, they're well on their way. On there, that promise. But he hasn't gotten there yet, yes. and I think people are holding him, holding him to that. Okay, I, I want to just ask some questions about today, for instance. He was asked, you know, really specific questions. How many times has this happened? Uh, when did you realize it was racist? What is the risk of him getting into that minutia, of, of, of getting into answering those questions in a detailed way? Because clearly he's not answering them, and clearly there must be some sort of risk in not doing that, or maybe not. Well, um, you know, what do they say? Starve a fever, right? So uh, you don't want to be feeding this story in any way if you can. And every new fact is a potential new story. It's also the case that he said he doesn't really recall how many instances there were. And one of the things you don't want to do when you're managing a crisis situation is start to say things that are wrong. Yes. Right? Because you really need to have, yeah. maintain your moral authority. Yeah. So if he doesn't know, he shouldn't put out a number um, and, and, get proven, and get proven wrong on it. But I think what you're seeing is a very, very disciplined attempt to change the channel. Right? And you've seen three major policies rolled out mm -hmm. uh, in order to do that. And now you're seeing Mr. Trudeau, who up until a couple of days ago was... Uh, trying to be very contrite and take as many questions on this as possible yeah. now says I just don't want to talk about this anymore And he's kind of daring the world to keep forcing it to be an issue. I, I don't think strategically he should try to move on I think that he should be available to answer questions But what he should do is actually try and move the issue away from this instance of racism and over to addressing systemic racism And he has an opportunity to do that so he could put out a platform piece taking a page from the NDP Addressing racial justice or he could even as he's making uh, policy Policy announcements show how expanding um, expanding yeah. public services actually helps to address inequality Michael. and racism. He could, in the Michael, country. but at the risk of be sounding insensitive, the way Rosie said we, we should we won't. and <laughs> talk politics about this, this election is not going to be decided on who's done the most for black or brown people in Canada. This election is going to be decided by who has the most to say about the affordability crisis going on in middle class and working class Canada. And every big campaign knew that from the beginning. So this is not going to there's no interest in the Liberal Party to further prosecute this. I think I agree with David. The ballot box question is not going to be, is Justin Trudeau a racist? Yeah. I think when you're dealing with a crisis situation, the goal is to get to the end game as fast as possible, just on a strategic point. Mm -hmm. So I think the Liberals trying to turn the page is smart strategy, politically speaking. Okay, can we talk about response a little bit and then how they move forward? I think it was generally agreed that Jagmeet Singh had a moment uh, last week and it was an opportunity that, you know, we couldn't have seen coming and he took it. I, I wonder, though, beyond this phone call that, that may or may not happen between the two of them, what more mm. does he do to keep this conversation active? Well, he's got to, I think he's been doing it yeah. a bit, and he probably needs to, to expand it further, which is to not dwell on this anymore and try to extract any more political value out of this, yeah. but use this to now move on and talk about the other ways, as Michael was saying, in which Mr. Trudeau's record doesn't quite perhaps match his rhetoric. And so you can use this as he's not what he appears to be. It's a little bit the conservative, the conservative campaign, yeah. not as advertised. Yeah. Yeah. That seemed to to where Jagmeet was seeing was taking it right away because he always lumped in grassy narrows. Yes. He yeah. always lumped yeah. in the uh, other issues. The other, with, exactly. With, yeah, with people, yeah. I think that's an interesting point on the, on the liberal tactic here to say Judge Justin Trudeau on his, on his past four years. When this campaign started, both Sheer, uh, Mr. Singh wanted to run on Justin to run on his record, and he didn't want to do that. That's right? right. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, it's convenient to say, "Well, look at my last four years. If we want to have this discussion, let's talk about the totality of your record." Because I'm pretty sure all opposition candidates would love to point out the flaws in the liberal record over the last four years. Yeah, Michael. Well, I don't think that we can get away from this issue because Jagmeet Singh is running to be prime minister. Yeah. So we have a brown-skinned turban man who's running, and we have a prime minister who dressed up as a brown-skinned turban man. So this issue will stay alive as long as Jagmeet Singh is, 
is running for prime minister. What about what about how Sheer and I just have a minute here. What about how Andrew Sheer? He has punted it. it. He punted it because he called him a racist. He went right there. He tried to make that argument that Trudeau's a racist, and I think it fell flat. I don't think I think it was an overreach, and he went too far. I think Chair's response is very, uh, it was appropriate in the sense of it was just to the point, this is what I think. Uh, ultimately, J Justin Trudeau has said his behavior is racist, mm -hmm. right? Now, is he an actual racist? You can decide. But the behavior <laughs> he's admitted is, a ra is racist. The behavior, action right? Right. Right. Yeah. I think we saw a genuine response from Jigmeet Singh. He, he demonstrated leadership, and we saw political opportunism and a strategic move from Andrew Scheer. What, what should voters take away from it? I, I know that that's, that's you know, you, you have a message that, that as, a, you know, as a political party that you want voters to take. What should they take away from this, this moment as they watch this unfold? Because a lot of people are saying to me, oh, I want to talk about issues again. But what should they take away from this? That this is about character? That this is about leadership? Uh, I think probably, and I think that, you know, there's a real onus on Mr. Trudeau now, I think, to... I don't think he will get past this just with policy. I think he actually needs to do something to rekindle his relationship with people, and something out of the ordinary. You know, I think of Brian Mulroney in 1988, when, he, when the free trade debate had come crashing down around him, leaving his bubble campaign and walking right out into protesters and sitting down with protesters yeah. to discuss the free trade agreement with them. All right, I, I think that Mr. Trudeau needs to do something reasonably dramatic about this in order to get past that leadership character judgment question that's now in Just play. 10 seconds. I think ultimately uh, the issue of structural racism is an issue in Canada, so mm -hmm. uh, this conversation needs to continue after this. But if you're a conservative, it fits into your narrative that, that he's a hypocrite. He's yeah. not as advertised, and there's a variety of policy initiatives that he hasn't delivered on, or he's contradicted himself throughout this campaign. Or Completely agree with Shakira. Racism is an issue in Canada. Structural racism is an issue in Canada, and it's something that Canadians need to be talking about. Okay. Thank you all. See you Thank next you. week. Who knows what will happen in a week? <laughs> <laughs>
we need more public spending from the provincial and federal governments to provide or up the supply of affordable and accessible housing in the Charlottetown, in Charlottetown and area. So here's the project. Okay. What's this going to be? This is a site of a project that's been in the works for the last six, eight months. Mayor Brown wants the next federal government to help cities build more like this. And it may not look like much yet, but this site will soon be rental apartments geared to income. It will be a 60 unit apartment building. 50 units will be dedicated towards uh, affordable and accessible housing. Charlottetown's growth is driven by jobs, immigration and students. Now there's a waiting list to rent some places. Including Sierra Elkerton. She too was desperately trying to find somewhere to live. The search is not going well at all. <laughs> so this is the kitchen. Um, She's paying $6.25 a month furnished for this basement unit. An absolute steal in a red hot market. But an inspection just revealed the apartment doesn't meet code. So Sierra's being tossed. Duplex, fully furnished, two bedroom, upstairs apartment. The cheapest ads she's looking at list apartments for nearly twice the price. Close to UPEI is $1,700. Holy hell. <laughs> Cost of living is way too high. Considering it's such a small city, um, cost is way too high. Way too high is something the mayor hears often. What's the one that sort of sticks? inside you and motivates you to drive forward on, on housing and affordable housing? Single women that don't have a place to stay. We just, the city of Charlottetown just opened a shelter for women. Just, mm -hmm. it's called Blooming House. And I get calls this past week, I received two, I actually received one visit to the office who, uh, from a woman who's living in her car out in, in Walmart, in the Walmart parking lot, and another woman that's been in Blooming House now for almost a month and she needs a place to live. Come right in. What, it's not even locked? No. Mayor Brown acknowledges short-term rentals like this tourist apartment listed on Airbnb make housing Airbnb even more limited. That's not the only issue. We have other but he doesn't believe this alone is the source of the problem. Ultimately, he wants the feds under whichever party to use the big wallet they have to help build more affordable housing. The federal and provincial government must get back into providing more public housing. Who's got the big jumps? <laughs> These are big issues for big politicians, but they have consequences for people like Jeff, who worries he'll have to couch surf while his kids go to live full time with their mother. A cost to him that has nothing to do with money. Basically, I, they'll have to come visit me at, at my mom's house where they won't be able to stay the night. I love my kids and I, I want to be in their lives like so that that's it's heartbreaking like I can't sit down and watch TV with my kids or play with my kids right now because because of the, I don't have a place to go or take them. After we met with Jeff he managed to find a new place to live so did Sierra but now like so many Canadians they're paying more than they feel they can afford. David Coleman, CBC News, Charlottetown. Unaffordable housing is no surprise to millennials, but one of the largest voting groups in the country has plenty of other concerns this election. I would rather see the conversation shift from candidate to platform. Next, our weekly check-in with six undecided millennials making sense of the policies and the politics. By geography, background, marital status, there's all kinds of ways to group voters together. And this election, one particular group holds an awful lot of power, millennials. Definitions vary, but generally the term applies to anyone born between the early 1980s and the late 90s or 2000. And this election, according to Abacus data, they make up around 37% of eligible voters, which means that if they band together, they could in fact decide which party wins. Among them, these six undecided voters from all over the country who we are now following throughout this campaign as they make up their minds. Tonight, their takes after week one. So first week of campaign so far has been very insightful. Shocking. Dicey. It's frustrating. Bombarded with uh, tax cut 
Hi, um, this is Emily from the Life Scene Rewriting. My name is Ivan White. I will be voting from the Yukon Writing. Vancouver Center. Hi, my name is Saba Chaudhary. Hi, I'm Christian Hebert from the Sewer Smooth Mountain Writing in the upcoming federal election. The first week of the campaign, I think, has went really well. Um, we've seen uh, a little bit of a different side from each of the candidates that chose to attend the debates. Um, I think it was a really big statement that Justin Trudeau chose not to participate. Um, it just seems really uh, disrespectful to Canadians. The first observation that I have to give is that there's no key election issue that has emerged as the issue that's going to define the election so far. Lots of media appearances a few minor policy announcements, yet very non-committal. I really appreciated Mr. Singh kind of taking Bill 21 on head-to-head. -head. Um, I think that it is an important issue, and I really respected that, uh, that he thought so as well. I think it's fundamentally un-Canadian to discriminate against people based on their religion. Moving on to the Liberal Party. So they're definitely targeting child care benefits. Um, I think that's cool. Um, increasing 50% for exactly the CCB. Um, they've also looked into like a 15 week parental leave for adoptive parents, which I think is really cool as well, especially for LGBTQ communities. The Conservatives were going to incorporate Indigenous traditional knowledge in their climate change and energy policy. They don't have a, a, a full blown nation to nation Policy. A lot of the discourse has been around the candidates themselves and I think that the honesty and the integrity of the individual candidates is something that's an election issue for sure, but I would rather see the conversation shift from candidate to platform, from candidate to actual policies and the values of the various parties. And I saw no new ideas to deal with anything difficult. How are we eventually going to bring in more money than we spend? How are we going to deal with some current ethical and moral dilemmas within the government? and no leaders. The local Green Party has some great key points that got me really excited about their party. Um, there is one downside and that is the carbon tax. I think Andrew Scheer was the leader for me um, as far as the f fiscal responsibility is concerned. I really do think that he's going to be able to reduce our national debt, cut taxes, hopefully get rid of the carbon tax for us Yukoners, and those are all really big important things for me. The heightened uh, tensions that come out around elections often impact visible minorities and marginalized communities and people of color. Racism has been a large part of the conversation already, especially with this news of Justin Trudeau's history with brown and blackface. There's not much I can say about it. Not impressed, very disappointed. What personally frustrates me, really, are politicians, pundits, partisans who are trying to peel our uh, attention away from issues that really matter in this election. I, I personally know of people who have done racist things and people who are racists, which are two very different things. There's a lot of distraction, d distracting news, um, including the RCMP investigation tweet by the Conservative Party. So those are kind of just I'm trying to put those away and really focus on um, policy. There's a lot of negative campaigns on parts of the PC. The Liberal Party appears to just want to brush off any hard questions that they need to have answered for the future. So I don't think I'm any closer in deciding who to vote for. Uh, what I will say is that I need more substance. At this point, I'm still undecided. I'm still waiting to be spoken to by, I guess, a major policy announcement. I can't wait to see where they all end up. So interesting. The moment is next, but first here's Adrian with a preview of a big project she's been working on starting tomorrow night on The National. What do you do if you're the president of the Toronto Raptors? You're fresh off an NBA championship win. The season is over. The summer is here. You're exhausted. You probably need a break. If you're Masai Ujiri, you don't exactly pull up a lounge chair at a lake. You need to be confident with yourselves. You crisscross the continent of Africa. Ujiri has gone to Nigeria, Rwanda, Cameroon, Mali, South Sudan. He's come here to Tanzania. Hey, Toronto everywhere. Not just looking for talent but largely to let the kids of this continent know there is a path for them in basketball. Looking for finding and making the next giants of Africa. That's tomorrow on The National. A cop pulled a woman over yesterday for speeding on the way into Edmonton. What happens next? A sudden co-starring role with a pro wrestler, instant internet fame, and tonight's moment. He's 
serious right now. For some, a traffic stop is a moment to turn on the charm. That's not a citation, is it? But tonight's no, moment is different. Do you know who I am? I have no idea. Well, I'm Lacey Evans, so you can so go ahead. Lacey Evans? So let's back up a second with that who is Lacey Evans. This genuinely bemused Alberta Mountie became the Canadian foil to one of pro wrestling's top stars. Do you hear me? Evans' character, a southern belle with, shall we say, some rough edges. And she seemed so to be in character you here. You should know exactly who I am. Sorry, ma'am, I don't. Uh, hey, so here's the ticket. You've got to be kidding me. Yeah, so you nasty thing. I'll pay the ticket. Canada is terrible, and I can't wait to get well, back. Welcome to Edmonton. Oh. Since Evans posted this exchange, it's become a top Twitter trend. The general sentiment, it's the ugly American versus the polite Canadian. Alberta RCMP assured us the member engaged in the normal execution of his duties. But Twitter now deems that straight-faced welcome to Edmonton a classic Canadian burn. I don't know who she is either, for the record, but I haven't watched wrestling since I was about eight. Anyway, <laughs> I like the RCMP guy. That's the National for Sunday, September 22nd. Have a good night, everybody.